Now we are to have the great pleasure of listening to Brother Nor walk in the name of Jehovah our God forever, Brother Nor. It certainly is a pleasure to be able to bring out new publications for the different brothers who are in these different lands. And uh, this afternoon, those who would like to get copies of the publications that I just gave to the speakers can get them at the book counters in the book room. Tomorrow morning, when our brothers from the Spanish-speaking countries meet, there will be supplies of the new book at their meetings so they can obtain them there if they find it more convenient. This morning we had our baptismal service for those who have dedicated themselves to the Most High God. We were happy to be here and see so many of the other sheep being gathered together at this convention. Very likely their first assembly. And it gives me great pleasure to announce that there were 4,640 who are now walking in the name of Jehovah, their God forever. The work continues to go ahead and it makes our hearts glad and we certainly want to see these new associates of ours walk in the name of Jehovah our God forever. The latter days or final days of this old world were foretold to be a time of most important decision. This decision will affect the eternal destiny of each individual. It will prove whether he is worthy of eternal life in a righteous new world or not. How can a person know that his decision is the right one? He can know this unmistakably by his choice of the right God to worship. That is what makes the decision the most important one to make. The choice of the God who has promised and who can be depended upon to fulfill his promise to create a warless new world makes a person's decision the right one. That there would be many gods among whom to choose and that some would choose the God that offers everlasting peace, security and prosperity, the inspired prophecy indicated when, he said, when it said. But in the latter days it shall come to pass that the mountain of Jehovah's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills. The people shall flow into it and many nations shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of Jehovah and to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways, and he will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of Jehovah from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples, and will decide concerning strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, 
and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of Jehovah of hosts hath spoken it. For all the peoples walk every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of Jehovah our God forever and ever. Both heavenly and human events since A.D. 1914 mark our days as the latter days or the final days of this old world. Therefore, let everyone who reads Micah's prophecy and looks for its fulfillment now ask himself, who of all the peoples is it that is walking in the name of Jehovah as God? Is it the recently established Republic of Israel, or is it the Jewish people as a whole through whose faithful ancestors we have received the sacred Hebrew scriptures? The answer must be no, for during the past 19 centuries, the name of the living and true God has not come to be known to mankind through such natural Jews. Who then, by authentic records in law courts of the land, not accepting the United States Supreme Court, and by the reports in the newspapers, the magazines, bulletins, and books, both secular and religious, both friendly and hostile, yes, who by these records are indisputably shown to be the people that have chosen to walk in the name of Jehovah as their God forever and ever? The honest, unbiased answer must be Jehovah's Witnesses. Moreover, the enormous amount of literature that these people have distributed and the hundreds of thousands of public lectures that they have given in these latter days gives answer to the same effect. Even the enemies are obliged to admit that in such witnesses of Jehovah alone the prophecy of Micah finds its fulfillment today. For this reason, in the last two decades, the name of the Most High God has come under a great deal of discussion, and their foes claim that the witnesses do not have the correct name, although this name has been appearing in the Bible translations for hundreds of years. Recently, an endeavor was made to remove all basis for the name by which these Christian witnesses are known. How? By taking the very name of the Most High God out of the Bible translation. This was the case in the Revised Standard Version of the Holy Bible, published in 1952, and the publication of which was commercially advertised as the greatest Bible news in 341 years. The Bible was written in Hebrew, Aramaic and common Greek originally. And in the Hebrew scriptures, the divine name is written as a tetragrammaton or four Hebrew consonants which correspond in Latin with J-H-V-H, -H, and in English with Y-H-W-H. -H. For centuries the name has been pronounced Jehovah, but within the last century Bible scholars have preferred the pronunciation Yahweh as more correct. The translators of the Revised Standard Version, being an American committee, and succeeding to the committee that had produced the American Standard Version of 1901, 
had a most important decision to make regarding their translation. And that was res with respect to the name of the Most High God. This was in view of paragraph 8 of the preface of the American Standard Version, which reads, The change first proposed in the appendix of the English Revised Version, that which substitutes Jehovah for Lord and God, printed in small capitals, is one which will be unwelcome to many because of the frequency and familiarity of the term displaced. But the American revisers, after a careful consideration, were brought to the unanimous conviction that the Jewish superstition, with uh, which regard the divine name as too sacred to be uttered, ought no longer to dominate in the English or any other version of the Old Testament as it fortunately does not in the numerous versions made by modern missionaries. This memorial name, explained in Exodus the third chapter, verses 14 and 15, and emphasized as such over and over in the original text of the Old Testament, designates God as the personal God as the covenant God, the God of revelation, the deliverer, the friend of his people, not merely the abstractly eternal one of many French translations, but the ever-living helper of those who are in trouble. This personal name, with its wealth and sacred associations, is now restored to the place of the sacred text to which it has an unquestionable claim. End of the quotation from that version of the Bible. With the much heralded and widely celebrated release of the revised standard version on September 30th, 1952, the Translation Committee made known its decision to the world. The divine name had been denied its unquestionable claim to a place in the sacred text and had been ruled out completely. In paragraph 17 of the preface of this new 1952 version, the committee explains its reasons for its decision. And in what it says, it makes complete fools out of the American Standard Version Committee regarding the divine name. Paragraph 17 reads of the Revised Standard Version. Quoting, a major departure from the practice of the American Standard Version is the rendering of the divine name, the Tetragrammaton. The American Standard Version used the term Jehovah. The King James Version had employed this in four places, but everywhere else except in three cases where it was employed as part of a proper name, used the English word Lord, or in certain cases, God, printed in capitals. The present revision returns to the procedure of the King James Version, which follows the precedent of the ancient Greek and the Latin translators, and the long-established practice in the reading of the Hebrew scriptures in the synagogue while it is almost, if not quite certain, that the name was originally pronounced Yahweh. This pronunciation was so indicated when the Masoretes added vowel signs to the continental Hebrew text. For two reasons, the committee 
has returned to the more familiar usage of the King James Version. One, the word Jehovah does not accurately represent any form of the name ever used in Hebrew. And two, the use of any proper name for the one and only God, as though there were other gods from whom he had to be distinguished, was discontinued in Judaism before the Christian era and is entirely inappropriate for the universal faith of the Christian church. End of the quotation. You thousands of conventioners here at Yankee Stadium who are baptized followers of the Lord Jesus Christ and who therefore represent a considerable portion of what is called the Christian Church, does that Revised Standard Version's preface speak for you? Do you agree that the use of any proper name for the one and only God as though there were other gods from whom he had to be distinguished is entirely inappropriate for the universal faith of the Christian church? How would the Apostle Paul reply to the statement? He said, Although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom, all are, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. The Apostle Paul here stated that there are many creatures in heaven and on earth that are called either gods or lords. So amid all the rival claims of godship, was it necessary for Paul's God to be distinguished by a name to make him exclusive as the one God? We Christians confess that there is but one God Yet his being, the one God, is disputed and denied by others. And there are, billion, there are a billion and a half people today who are worshiping countless other gods and to whom these gods are just as real as the one true God is to Bible Christians. It is therefore most appropriate for the Christian God to be distinguished by a name. Also in the universe, there are many that are called lords, although there is only one real lord for Christians, and hence, too, it is appropriate and necessary for Christians to identify who their lord is by the name Jesus Christ. There have been quite a number There have been quite a number of criticisms of the revised standard version, some clergymen calling it the modernist Bible, this new Bible of modernism. But among the many critics of that version, how many have shown appreciation for God's name and have criticized it for barring his name out and hiding it from the readers. We have at least one such criticism here as published in the New York newspaper, the Daily Compass of October the 28th, 1952, and it comes from a Jewish editor. Here is part of what he writes on the Revised Standard Version. Quoting now, the 32 Protestant scholars may have attempted to revise the scriptures in the clearest, most accurate English of our time. What? 
In so doing, they actually obscured the original meaning. Moreover, by rendering some original Hebrew names, such as Jehovah into English words, that never convey the original meaning, Jehovah is a compound word of three tenses, I was, I am, I will be. The translators have greatly transgressed and they have committed grievous sin. For by using the word Lord for Jehovah, they only add confusion to the readers who will now not know when the reference is to Jehovah, the creator of all, or to the accepted Christian son who is so referred to throughout the evangelical works, Lord, moreover, has several coming meanings. End of the quotation. Two days before the release of the Revised Standard Version, the Roman Catholic Confraternity of Christian Doctrine in America released volume one of its edition of the Holy Bible, containing its first eight books from Genesis to Ruth inclusive. But this new American Catholic version follows the Dewey version, and the Dewey version never did use the name Jehovah in its main text. Hence we make no comment in this connection except to quote from its footnote at Exodus 3.14 as to God's name represented in the Hebrew text by the Tetragrammaton. And now quoting. Out of reverence for this name, the term Adonai, my Lord, was later used as a substitute. The word Lord in the present version represents this traditional usage. The word Jehovah arose from a false reading of this name as it is written in the current Hebrew text. However, some comment as to the Revised Standard Version has properly been expected from Jehovah's Witnesses. Those who have been aware of the omission of the sacred name from that version have watched to see what the witnesses would say about it. They have expected us to get into something of a furor over it. We have here the prediction of a religious magazine, the Christian Century, of three years ago, June the 28th, 1950, which says of the Revised Standard Version that was to come out, quoting, but Jehovah's Witnesses have a way of holding their beliefs with passionate conviction. If the new version appears with the name of the Old Testament deity in any other form than Jehovah, its translators can look forward to being under hot fire from the day the first copy comes off the press. Five days after the new version was released, a religious clergyman published an article entitled Revised, Easier to Read Version of the Bible in the Chicago Sunday Tribune of October the 5th, 1952. In paragraph six, he said this, there are more than 300 words, the Revised Standard Version preface points out, that have entirely different meanings today than in the 17th century. The name Jehovah for Lord or God, a purely manufactured word which appears a few times in the King James Version is not used. Jehovah's Witnesses are greatly upset by this omission. End of the quotation. Here in the presence of this tremendous international assembly, of Jehovah's Witnesses in Yankee Stadium with representatives of 96 lands on hand. We feel it is the proper occasion for us to say something in behalf of Jehovah's Witnesses 
and so we do. If If we were one of the 29 religious denominations that are members of the National Council of the Churches of Christ in the United States of America, which has authorized the Revised Standard Version and holds a copyright for it, we should have valid reason to be upset greatly by the divine name's omission but we are glad that we are not a member of that National Council. We do not criticize the Council for producing a new and modern version of the Bible. That is a commendable effort and work and we expect to find it useful, making quotations from it from time to time in the Watchtower publications. <clears throat> what we do feel justified in criticizing is the great indignity that the Translation Committee has rendered to the grandest and most worthy name in the universe and the motives stated and unstated that prompted them to do this. If in the Revised Standard Version they had chosen to use the form of the name Yahweh instead of Jehovah, there would have been no room for criticism. We ourselves think the form Yahweh is nearer the true pronunciation. But as no one today knows the exact pronunciation due to an ancient false reference in not pronouncing the holy name, we keep on using the form Jehovah for present purposes until the divine owner of the name himself reveals its correct pronunciation. <clears throat> Maybe that will be by the resurrecting of the prophet Moses to whom he himself pronounced the name or maybe otherwise. So the basis of our criticism of the Revised Standard Version is not the disuse of the form Jehovah, but the omission of God's name in any form whatsoever in all of the 6,823 times where it occurs in the Hebrew text and the using instead of a confusing and undistinguishable title, namely, the Lord. The procedure would stand to the shame of any translator that pretends to be Christian. Still more, it stands to the great depreciation of the Translation Committee, which claims to be Protestant, when many modern versions that have recently come out or are still in process of coming out in English and other languages by Roman Catholic translators use the name Jehovah or other forms such as Yahweh, 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 and Yava, and several others. We could name five such French Roman Catholic translations, two Spanish and two British. Said an executive director of the copyright holding National Council of Churches in defense of the omission, and I quote now, 
We can never agree on the use of the name of God, so there is no need to discuss it. When I say the Lord, it automatically means God. It depends on what you wish to stress. God is God. He needs no name for me. I feel very near to him and call him my father. I would never call my, fa my earthly father by his name. Only those who don't know him like I do need to do that to distinguish him from other earthly fathers. There is only one God. End of quotation. In reply to this we say, Jesus Christ was closer to God than this executive director is, and he too called God my father. <clears throat> but if it was enough for Jesus Christ and his followers to call God my father, then why did Jesus, the Son of God, in his Sermon on the Mount, teach us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> Jesus also called his heavenly Father, Lord, saying, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. But if that was sufficient, why then did Jesus pray with his apostles the last night he was with them as a man and say, I have manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Holy Father, keep them in thy name which thou hast given me that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in thy name, which thou hast given me. I made known to them thy name. I will make it known. Why, in some days earlier did he pray, Father, glorify thy name, in answer to which there was a voice from the heaven saying, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. It was because Jesus knew his father had a distinctive name as the prophet greater than Moses. He said, he had come in his father's name and not in his own name, and he wanted his followers to know the father's name. That is why the revelation he pictured his genuine faithful followers as having his father's name written in their foreheads. There being only one God does not deny he has a name nor does he forbid his sons on earth to call him by his personal name. For to call him by his unique name does not denote undue familiarity or disrespect. Contrarywise, it denotes greater respect, awe, and worship, more so than the childlike expression our father does. The aforeferred to executive director of the National Council appears to be ashamed of the name of his God, the God whom he calls Father. If he is not ashamed of it, then why does he not want other people to know the name of his Father? It would be a big convenience to know it. For then when people who worship other gods with personal names wanted to talk about the director's father, they could definitely mention his name instead of awkwardly saying 
Mr. Timothy Tugbutton's God. True sons of a father are not ashamed of his name rather than want to hide it from others who are not sons and who may reproach, abuse, and misrepresent it or take it in vain. They are glad to stand up in defense of it and heap honor upon it. They show they are not illegitimate children by being able to give the name of their father. The true congregation The true congregation or church of the living God are spiritual sons of his. When God began to take believers out of the uncircumcised Gentiles to make them a part of the Christian congregation, the disciple James saw that the prophecy of Amos 9, 11, and 12 was fulfilled. So he said, to the special conference of apostles and other older disciples in Jerusalem, Simeon, Peter, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this the words of the prophet agree, as it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David which has fallen that the rest of men may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who has made these things known from of old. If God had no name, then it would be meaningless for him to predict, predict that the uncircumcised Gentiles would be called by his name, and that he would take them out of the nations to be a people for his name, not for the name of Jesus, mind you. The prophecy could not fail. God promised to take out of all nations a people for his name, and whether men in or outside of Christendom like it or not, he does unmistakably have a name people today, you Jehovah's Witnesses. The divine name for which they stand and to which they bear witness cannot be wiped out by omitting it from the modern translations of the Bible. If the English-speaking witnesses of Jehovah were dependent upon the 1952 English translation of the Bible for the way they are named, to have a scriptural basis. It would be something to be greatly upset about. But the almighty God Jehovah has made his people independent of all translators that choose to obscure his name. Not only has he provided a translation that rightly puts his name in the Christian Greek scriptures, but also now he is having a translation made that sets forth his holy name in the Hebrew scriptures. In evidence of this, In evidence of this, I am overjoyed to release to this 96th Nation Assembly
I am overjoyed to release to this 96th Nation Assembly the New World Translation of the Octetuch, the first eight books of the Bible translated directly from the original Hebrew text. This volume sets out in modern English nearly a third of the Hebrew Aramaic scriptures or the books of Genesis to Ruth inclusive. To Jehovah God, we give our heartfelt thanks through Jesus Christ for providing this much of his word in present-day English through the New World Bible Translation Committee. We shall expect the rest later. <laughs> the New World Translation of the Hebrew Scriptures dignifies and honors the worthy name of the Most High God who gave us his written word to make himself known to us. What he is called is not what man has made up and called him. It is what he called himself when his prophet Moses asked who he should say had sent him to the sons of Israel enslaved in Egypt. Now in these latter days, before the universal war of Armageddon, God has vindicated what he then called himself by now pronouncing a name people for himself, by producing them and having them live here upon the earth just as they were living in the days of the apostles. He has restored this people for his name's sake as his prophecy for these latter days disclosed. Therefore, thus saith the Lord Jehovah, now will I bring back the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and I will be jealous for my holy name and they shall know that I am Jehovah their God. The ever-living God is jealous in this respect, as Exodus 34, 14, Fenton's translation further emphasizes, Jehovah there saying, you shall not worship another god, for the ever-living ever is jealous of his name. He is a jealous god. Or, as the New World Translation renders this verse, for you must not bow down to another god because Jehovah is exclusively devoted to his name. He is a god exacting exclusive devotion. Since he is jealous of his name or exclusively devoted to it and will tolerate no rivalry by the name of another god among his people, then it would surely bring down upon us divine indignation if we gave prominence to the names of false gods and of notable men and women and at the same time scorn the name of the true God who is jealous for it, exclusively devoted to it. We may therefore, with safety to ourselves and to God's pleasure, Use this New World Translation of the Hebrew Scriptures with due respect for the jealous God, the God exacting exclusive devotion. It renders every occurrence of the sacred tetragrammaton in the Hebrew Octetuch by its acceptable English equivalent, Jehovah. This procedure guarantees 
the proper rendering of the rest of the 6,823 occurrences of the Tetragrammaton in the best Masoretic Hebrew text of the Bible. But not only that. The New World Translation takes note of the 134 cases where the ancient Hebrew sophrim or Bible copyists changed the original Hebrew text from the Tetragrammaton or Jehovah to read Adonai or the Lord. And also some other cases where they changed it to Elohim or God. In the Hebrew Octetuch, there are 17 cases of this, and all these have been restored to their original reading, Jehovah, as a result. When the New World Translation of the Hebrew Scriptures is finally completed in three volumes by divine favor, it should contain considerably more occurrences of Jehovah than the current Hebrew Masoretic text has. Thus we are most happy to have a Bible translation that did not copy the example of the Protestant translation that returns to the procedure of the King James Version, which follows the precedent of the ancient Greek and Latin translators and the long-established practice in the reading of the Hebrew Scriptures in the synagogue. Thank God! that instead of following the long-established practice of the Jewish synagogue that rejected Jesus Christ and rejected his 12 apostles and other disciples, the New World Translation Committee followed the example of the chief vindicator of Jehovah God, his son Jesus Christ, and thus comes out for the vindication of God's name. We show reverence for that sacred name, not by superstitiously refusing to pronounce it and using a weak and confused substitute, no, but, pri but by pronouncing and making known the name, never mentioning or taking it in a worthless way, but showing all the wonderful and glorious things that are associated with that name all the things that have been said, written, and done in that name, all the precious promises that have been made in that name and that are being fulfilled in our very day or will be fulfilled in the blessed future, thus magnifying that name and building up man's respect for it and their faith in it. In our new version, Deuteronomy 10:17 reads, For Jehovah our God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, mighty, and fear-inspiring God. Thus Jehovah is worthy of distinction, and our new version affords him distinction in a special rendering in a number of places. At Genesis, the first chapter in the first verse, the opening verse of the Bible we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There, as the Bible footnote shows, the Hebrew word for God is Elohim, and it is without the definite article ha, meaning thee. However, there are numerous places in the Hebrew text where Elohim is preceded by the definite article. In many places, the New World Translation has seen it to be proper and effective to translate this definite article, Ha, before Elohim into English. The first case of this are the first cases of this are in Genesis 5:22 and 23 concerning the faithful prophet Enoch 
and it reads as follows. And after his producing Methuselah, Enoch went on walking with the God 300 years. Meanwhile, he became father to sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch amounted to 365 years, and Enoch kept walking with the God. Then he was no more, for God took him. End of quotation. On the expression, the God, the Bible footnote says, quote, Here we have the first and second instance where the Hebrew term Elohim is preceded by the definite article Ha. Use of the article here is deliberate, doubtless because of the move toward false worship indicated shortly before this at Genesis 4.26. Hence it is here emphasized that Enoch walked with the true God so we feel justified in using the definite article the here for emphasis and identification. The New World Translation could have rendered the expression even stronger than the literal rendering the God for the noted Hebrew grammarian Wilhelm uh, Jacinius renders ha Elohim by the word the one true God. At Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, the 35th verse, the New World, Moses says to the Israelites, You, you have been shown so as to know that Jehovah is the God. There is no other besides him. This expression, the God, emphasizes that Jehovah is to be distinguished from other gods, hence the fitness of his taking a name to himself. One thing is sure, the religious clergy who believe in the pagan doctrine of the Trinity will not like the New World Translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. The Trinitarian clergy point out that the title Elohim as applied to the Creator, is in the plural number and literally means gods. They claim that this is a proof of the teaching of the Trinity in the Hebrew Scriptures, namely that there are three persons in one God. But their own argument recoils against them in disproof, for, as they themselves point out, Elohim means gods and not persons. So to follow through with their own argument, the title Elohim would teach that there are two or more gods in one instead of three persons in one God. Thus, the Trinitarians would be guilty of arguing that there is a multiplicity of gods contrary to their insistence that there are not three gods but only one God, except that this one God has three persons in himself. Right at the start, the footnote of the New World Translation of Genesis 1-1 knocks the ground out from and under the Trinitarian champions by saying, quote, the form of the title Elohim is plural. The plural of excellency or majesty and not to deny, to denote a multiple personality. The Greek Septuagint renders Elohim as ho theos, showing it means an individual God. Compare Judges 16, 23, and 24, footnote A, end of quotation. This latter footnote shows that Elohim does not mean a plurality of gods or persons because it judges 16, 23, and 24 Elohim, it appears, it applies to the false god Dagon, just one false god, not many, and hence the title Elohim must be in the plural of excellence or majesty. Two Elohim 
is followed by a singular verb showing only one God is meant. In fact, at Micah 4, 5, it says, All the peoples walk, every one in the name of his God. The Hebrew word translated God is this Elohim, in the plural of excellence or majesty. Another noteworthy thing, the New World Translation magnifies faith in God. The Apostle Paul in Hebrews chapter 11 states that the faithful witnesses of Jehovah from the first martyr Abel onward distinguish themselves by their faith in God. In the King James Version, however, the word faith occurs only twice in its entire Old Testament and only twice in the American Standard Version. But the New World Translation in the Octitude, or first eight books of the Bible, makes faith prominent before the reader by using the word seven appropriate times. For example, concerning Abraham, whom Paul calls the father of all those having faith, we read at Genesis 15:6. And he put faith in Jehovah, and he proceeded to count it to him as righteousness. Concerning the Israelites, as they're passing through the Red Sea, dry shod, we read at Exodus 14:31, Israel also got to see the great hand that Jehovah put in action against the Egyptians. And the people began to fear Jehovah and to put faith in Jehovah and in Moses, his servant. Judging by the seven occurrences of faith in the Octetuch, we may expect the word to have its due place in the rest of the translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Another precise rendering is that of the Hebrew word olam, which the King James Version renders as forever, perpetual, Everlasting, ever, evermore, always, lasting or old, etc. The word really means concealed time and so refers to time, the limit of which is concealed. Indefinite time in the past or in the future which may, of course, uh, be forever. So it is interesting to see the word at times rendered to time indefinite, especially in connection with the temporary typical things of the ancient Jewish system of things. The Apostle Paul says, those things were mere shadows or better thing of better things to come. Hence, they were not everlasting or eternal, but were temporary. However, the time when they were to end and give place to the realities was not known to man, and hence was in the indefinite future. The weekly Sabbath of the Jews passing away at the terminating of the law covenant, which God, with God on the day of Pentecost, A.D. 33, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and Christ's disciples entered into God's great Sabbath by faith in Christ's ransom sacrifice. How appropriate, then, the New World Translation rendering of Exodus 31, 16, and 17. And the sons of Israel must keep the Sabbath so as to carry out the Sabbath during their generations. It is a covenant to time indefinite between me and the sons of Israel. It is a sign to time indefinite because in six days Jehovah made the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day he rested and proceeded to refresh himself." End quote. How appropriate, too, the rendering of Exodus 40, 15 concerning the priesthood of Aaron's family, which was to pass away and be superseded by that of Christ, quoting now, so they must act as priests to me, and their anointing must serve continually for them as a priesthood to time indefinite during their generations. 
The New World Translation of the Hebrew Scriptures promises to put the teachers of eternal torment of the human soul after death into great difficulty. The Hebrew word Sheol, which the Catholic Dewey Version translates mainly as hell, and which the King James Version translates grave and pit as well as hell, occurs seven times in the Octitude. Each time, however, the New World Translation transliterates the Hebrew word into English and renders it uniformly as Sheol. For example, in the first occurrence of the word at Genesis 37-35, Jacob, bereaved of his beloved son Joseph, is translated as saying, I shall go down mourning to my son into Sheol. An article in the appendix gives valuable information regarding the Hebrew word Sheol and says, it quote, it is in the earth and is always associated with the dead and plainly means the common grave of all mankind or gravedom or the earthly, not sea, region of the dead in contrast with the Hebrew Keber which means an individual grave or burial place. <coughs> this information and this rendering of the Hebrew word will be of much comfort to those who have cruelly been taught that hell is a place of fiendish torment for human souls after death to the reproach of Jehovah God who is love. We know too from what the Hebrew scriptures as well as the Greek, uh, Christian Greek scriptures teach regarding the soul, <clears throat> that eternal torture of human souls after death is an impossibility and a foul defamation of God's name. Certainly the Hebrew soul, or certainly the human soul, could not be tormented forever in an invisible world if the human soul is not immortal but is destructible, mortal. Modern translators confuse their readers and leave them ignorant as to what a soul is, thus leaving them exposed to the pagan doctrines on the soul and to the perils of spiritism. The Hebrew word translated soul by all the translators is nephesh. God's word teaches that man is a nephesh, a soul, and does not have a soul breathed into his body as a thing separate and distinct. But how the Bible readers uh, know that fact, which in 1952 the Catholic Confraternity Translation of the Bible's first eight books rendered Genesis 2-7, then the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The 1952 Revised Standard Version likewise reads, and man became a living being. The Hebrew word there rendered being is nephesh, and the inspired apostle Paul, when quoting Genesis 2-7, writes, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. And you can see that in 1 Corinthians 15.45, the Catholic confraternity version. God's word teaches that animals lower than man are souls. But how would Bible readers ever know it when the Revised Standard Version renders Genesis 1, 20, 21, and 24, and God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures. So God created the great sea monster and every living creature that moves. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kind. The Hebrew word here rendered creature is nephesh, the same word as applied to the first man. When the lower animal dies, 
the soul or creature dies. So too, when man dies, the human soul dies and ceases to be. But how would Bible readers learn that fact when the Revised Standard Version makes the prophet Balaam say at Numbers 23.10, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. And make Samson say at Judges 16.30, let me die with the Philistines. In each case, the pronoun me is used to translate the Hebrew expression nefshi, which literally means my soul. Thus, when the Bible student, with his mind already filled with popular pagan theories on the human soul, reads such modern Bible versions, he receives no correction of his understanding of this vital subject. The false teaching about the soul is left standing and the Bible versions provide no adequate means for him to refute the pagan falsehoods. Jehovah God, the creator of the human soul, knows more about it than Socrates or Plato or Saint Augustine or any modern religious clergyman or spiritist ever did. So to learn the truth about the soul, we have to let God's Word talk, and it must talk in its own inspired language. That way, the Bible translator does not hide the complete, satisfying solution to the so-called mystery about the soul. And the reader will be enabled to grasp the most scientific teaching there is on this doctrine that affects his proper understanding of other vital Bible teachings such as immortality, punishment for sin, man's destiny, the ransom sacrifice, the resurrection, the destiny of Satan, the devil, etc. Here then is where a special feature of the New World Translation of the Hebrew Scriptures figures in. In its volume one, containing the Octetuch, or the first eight books of the Bible, the Translation Committee succeeded in understandably translating every one of the 231 occurrences of the Hebrew word nephesh as soul. Each such rendering of nephesh makes good English and good sense even in this 20th century. The way the first eight books of the Bible describe the soul is not something crude, something primitive that was dropped later in, dropped later on and revised when the pagan Grecian philosophies were developed and came in contact with the Hebrews. Instead, it is something fundamental, stable, and unchangeably correct. And it is a incomplete harmony with the teaching of Jesus and his disciples who wrote the Christian Greek scriptures. This can be demonstrated by comparing the appendix of the Octetuch on soul with that of the New World Translation of the Christian Greek scriptures released at this same Yankee Stadium during the International Assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses in 1950. For the Octetuch alone, the appendix lists 14 scripture instances to show that lower animals are souls according to the Bible. 57 instances to show that a living person or individual is a soul and does not have a separate platonic soul inside him. 49 instances to show that the creature's soul is mortal, destructible. 12 instances to show that a corpse or a carcass is a dead soul. 50 instances to show that one's life as an intelligent creature or animal is called soul. And thus the soul is said to be the blood because our life is dependent upon that fluid in our blood vessels. And 48 instances 
where a person speaks of himself or is spoken to or spoken about as a soul. There are also three cases in the Octetuch where God speaks of himself this way as if he had soul. This consistent rendering of the Hebrew word nephesh does not become archaic, clumsy, or unintelligible in any Bible verse, but it becomes invaluable in restoring correct Bible speech about the soul and explodes man-made, devil-inspired philosophy about it. On this score, Christendom's clergy need badly to get away from paganism and back to the Bible. And and the psychologists, the psychoanalysts, and the psychiatrists could learn solid principles about the soul in the Bible and know about the soul and how to effectively treat man. Much more could be said about the special features of the New World translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, but enough has already been said to reveal in what way other translations have come short and why searchers for life-giving Bible truths need the New World translation. The religious clergy of Christendom and the Jewry in general will not approve of this Bible version, but we do not look to them to pronounce this as an authorized version. Who is it that gives the real authorization to any Bible version? Religious denominations and religious heads and potentates can only authorize Bible versions for use in their respective churches or their synagogues and religious clergymen may be expected to forbid their congregations to read or use a New World Translation, or will recommend to them to avoid it. But we do not look for a Bible version authorized by religionists of this world. We look for one authorized by the Bible's creator, Jehovah God. He used men who were his witnesses to write the Bible, and he authorizes men who are now his witnesses and who belong to a people taken out of the nations for his name to provide us with a translation that upholds his holy name. It is upon such people for his name that he pours out his Holy Spirit. And it is to this name people that his commandment applies to preach this good news of the kingdom in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations. This pair of facts constitutes a higher and more valid authorization to produce a modern language version of his holy word than any religious sect, potentate, or hierarchy can confer. <laughs> Jehovah's New World Society will be very glad to use this New World translation of the scriptures and gratefully accept it from him and lovingly thank him for it. After reading it, they will be impelled to recommend it to the people. In the days of the apostles, the Christian Greek scriptures were written by the inspired disciples in the international language of the first century, the Kine or common Greek. Today the New World Translation is first published in the universal or international language of the 20th century, English. 
We trust that this Bible translation will survive the coming war of Armageddon with other good Bible translations in English besides all useful ones in other languages used by the New World Society for at least the temporary use of the Armageddon survivors of the various languages. It is reasonable, though, to await under God's kingdom a uniform translation of all holy scriptures based on the most authentic manuscripts in the one universal language that will be created by God and taught to all earth's inhabitants. Thus, all may get the proper rendering of the scriptures in that one language to convey the exact sense of God's miraculous book produced in vindication of his word, which endures forever. Certainly, all the living will for once want to have a perfect Bible and understand every word of it. Certainly, too, all those of mankind in general who will be resurrected from the memorial tombs will be quite uninformed about much or all of the Bible and will want to learn what the Bible teaches and what God said in it and how accurately he said it. The Bible should not become a dead book at any future time. Forever it will be a testimony to his praise, a memorial to his name, an imperishable doc document for all those of humankind who gain eternal life in the righteous new world. Jehovah's name people for centuries ago, who centuries ago were in a covenant with him under the law of Moses, were typical. They prophetically pictured those today whom God has taken out of all nations to be a people for his name. The spiritual Israelites, we see them today in this form, the New World Organization. To his ancient people, he said by the lips of Moses, Jehovah will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he swore to you, because you continue to keep the commandments of Jehovah your God, and you have walked in his ways. And all the peoples of the earth will have to see that Jehovah's name has been called upon you, and they will indeed be afraid of you. This foreshadows a fact that it is to be true of the spiritual Israelites who today are in a new covenant with God through the mediator Jesus Christ. The natural Israelites having rejected God's name 19 centuries ago, these spiritual, spiritual Israelites have become his Dane people. Now, we are in a crucial latter days of this world. The time of the judgment of the nations is here, when all peoples must seal their destiny by deciding in the name of which God to walk or to order their lives. By their course of action, the various peoples are eloquently proclaiming the God in whose name they have deci decided to walk, their chosen gods will fail them in the fiery day when true godship will be put to the test and the false gods will prove impotent to help the people and they will perish. But Jehovah in his prophetic word foretold the restoration of the remnant of his name people to his favor in the latter days and he said, and they shall walk up and down in my name, saith Jehovah. Exactly so. His name people of today have made their decision, a choice different from that of the peoples of the world, and they have taken up the words of Micah 4, 5 and say, we will walk in the name of Jehovah our God forever and forever.
They are striving to prove themselves his people indeed by keeping his commandments and walking in his ways and hurling abroad his kingdom of the new world. As a result, all the peoples of the earth, even the enemies, have come to see that Jehovah's name has been called upon them and they are afraid of them. No, not afraid of them because of being so mighty in number, for they are comparatively few, and they are not politically popular or commercially wealthy or militarily strong with any carnal weapons of bloodshed. But because of the invincible message that they have drawn from God's holy word and because of the omnipotent power that has manifested displayed itself from heaven upon them. Those of the nations who develop a wise fear learn to fear the God by whose name his people are called. They associate themselves with his witnesses and become part of the new world society that he is now forming. And they too make the decision to walk in the name of Jehovah as their God forever and ever. And indeed, in that name, they will walk everlastingly, for their God will cover them with the shadow of his hand and bring them through into his new world without end. Walking now and always in the name of Jehovah our God means life forevermore through Jesus Christ our Lord.